You're listening to the What's Happening Podcast with Gary Watts. Good afternoon. I'm here with Dr. Matt Howard, who's the chair, department head of neurosurgery at the University of Iowa. Good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Gary. Thanks I, for inviting me. I feel honored to have you here. I'm glad you could make it over. It's my so, pleasure. Great. So we're here to talk about a lot of things, and uh, let's start with maybe your background, your family. Tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe where you went to school, how you got interested in medicine, things like that, and then talk about your family. Sure. So we've been here, I'll fast forward a little bit. We moved to Iowa City from Seattle, Washington in uh, 1993. Okay. But uh, I grew up in a military family, and my dad was a uh, artillery officer, and he served for... 27 years, had a couple of combat tours in Vietnam. So we lived in a lot of different places as a kid, and I, I really enjoyed that that military family feel. Um, I went to college in Boston, uh, Tufts University, which is a small uh, liberal arts college, and then medical school, University of Virginia, which is my home state at the time because my dad's duty station where he retired was the Pentagon. Oh. And... Um, then trained in neurosurgery at the University of Washington in Seattle. And as part of that training, uh, all the trainees went to London, England for a year. So we were uh, surgeons in the British system for one year. And then um, when you finish your training, you have to find a job. And right. I found a great job at the University of Iowa. Great. And you've been chair since 2001? Correct. So tell us a little bit about the uh, – can you tell us more about the military background? What role – your father was in artillery – he traveled all over. Where, where, what places were you experienced? Or what? We or lived in uh, Germany for a number of years and um, many different locations in the United States. Back then, the uh, officers moved a lot. Uh, it would almost be every year. So I, I think I went to maybe 10 different schools. Really? Or something like Was that, that tough? You a lot know, of different kids? And well, you know, it's uh, yeah, that's a good question. The... Um, it varies. A lot of people have fond memories of being military dependent. Others, it wasn't so great. I found that um, there were five kids in my family, so you always have that crew with you when you move. And I was involved in uh, sports, which is really helpful. So as soon as you show up at a place, you um, you, you, know, you join the teams. And, and, and the cool thing about that is uh, I actually wasn't that good. But when I'd move to a new place, I would think, aha, you know, the previous problems, probably the coach wasn't that good. Or you know, I'm going to be so much better. And uh, that never happened, but hope would spring eternal. So for each move, you'd, you'd get a little bit more excited about a shot at being a better player. But it's fine because then you have teammates right away. And, right. and so who? So sports brought you together. It reminds me, I remember the Titans when the quarterback, Sunshine, they called him. He had long blonde hair. He came in from California. His father was in the Navy. It was somewhere stationed in Virginia, maybe Norfolk. We used to play them. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that was T.C. Williams. T.C. Williams, yeah. And our high school was called uh, Fort Hunt High School. We were in the, it was called the Gunderson District. So we used to play the, the Titans. Wow, and you played football and baseball, right? I did. I play, yeah, I did. And, yeah. and then Tufts, you played football and baseball. Yeah, and I played um, in both sports. Um, I played the same position, uh, bench. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It warmed. Yeah, <laughs> you still got to warm that. I had you were great I, in practice. I got to study the game uh, really closely. It just seemed, you know, my buddies were a lot better than me, right. and uh, it was, you know, it's just lifetime uh, time bonds form. And I mean, there's nothing like being on a team together. Right. So, what did you learn from your dad uh, from a military standpoint? Was he strict, disciplined? Did you learn things early in life being around your father? You would see, as you can imagine all kinds of uh, characters uh, among military officers. And some of them would be like the great Santini in that book. And and um, my dad passed away just a couple of years ago, and he was, he was buried at Arlington. It caused you to think back a little bit. And um, my mother's side of the family is very athletic. My father's side, not so much, but like to think and read books and things. And when you look back at his uh, growing up, his dad was a uh, enlisted man in the in the army. He, my dad was more cerebral, and a lot of like the PT tests and throwing fake hand grenades, stuff like that. I love that. Kid. He actually didn't he didn't like that yeah. too much. He ended up being um, well artillery and uh, missile defense, air defense. So it's it, it's a very technical logistics. Uh, thing. Yeah, he liked that. But he was he was a terrific leader. He really cared about his troops and. 
and um, he very few things would get him upset. But if but if he saw a leader um, not treating the troops right, that that he did not like that. What was his rank when he retired? Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel. All right. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, <clears throat> yeah, your family you have your wife Delia. Yes. Three daughters, right? Yes. Tell us about your daughters. So we have three girls. They all grew up in Iowa City. They all okay. went to uh, City High. And the oldest one, Caroline, um, when she finished, uh, she, she went to uh, college in Miami, Ohio. And then she served in the Peace Corps in Africa uh, for two years. Came right. back, was teaching in D.C. for a little while. And then during the pandemic, when you had to teach virtually anyway, she came back to Iowa City. And, you know, if you spend some time in Iowa City, I mean, there's no better place. Right. You know, so she moved. And then she met my son-in-law, uh, Elliot Sohn, who's an ophthalmologic surgeon over, over at the uh, hospital. Oh, wow. So it all worked out really, really great. Right. <laughs> Isn't it funny, you know, when you recruit people, you come into Iowa, you think, oh, what is it, hogs and cattle, and it's level, and there's no streams, there's no trees. And then soon they get in here and they start to see what really Iowa City's about. It's a small place, but it's got so much culture and so neat. And they fall in love with it. There's no place like it. I'm sure you've heard it, hear it all the time when you recruit physicians to Iowa. Yeah, it's it's an it's a real interesting um, recruiting challenge. Um, if you grew up here, you want to find a job and come back. You know, right. Because this once you're you know a little maybe you go out and do some things for a little while, but if you're ready to have a family, and uh, I mean there's there's no place better. People who grew up on the coast and have never been in the Midwest at all let alone Iowa, they need to be educated. And, and the easiest way for us is, is when people come in for their training. Because when you go, when you do what's called the match, you don't think you're going to be at that training place forever. So you right. don't, you're not so worried about where it is. And, but once you come here, you go, wow, this place is amazing. So there are lots and lots of faculty members who trained here and, and wanted very much to stay in Iowa City. So you're in high school, and you've traveled all over 10 or 11 different places as a child. When did you start thinking about medicine, and what drove you to be a neurosurgeon in neurology or whatever? What was your – to get to med school, how, what were you thinking? Yeah, I, I wish it was a little better story, but, <laughs> but the truth is um, I, I wanted to go uh, the military route, you know, be a paratrooper, do this kind of stuff, because I would say growing up, all these young officers, right. and you're living – cheek by jowl and they're there they've got sports teams going and all the kids are I mean, it's so fun right and uh but there was no war going on at the time and my dad was not a pushy person about any that that sort of thing and my mom who did not grow up in a military family whose husband did two tours of vietnam she goes no that that is not for you <laughs> that's a no you're going to be a doctor and and uh no one in the family had been the doctor but my mom was kind of a strong-willed person, so I said, okay, <laughs> right. I'll give it a try, see how, <laughs> see how it goes. Did you like science? Did you like biology, all the things you need to know? Yeah, I, yeah. I, do, I, I enjoy those, those topics. Actually, a lot more now. You know, at the time um, when you're thinking about applying to medical school, you got to be pretty serious about your studies, so there's a little bit of pressure there, and, and you got to take the studies quite seriously. Uh, I enjoyed it, but when I actually got to medical school, they've changed the curriculum these days, but back then, for the first two years, you do the same thing you did in college, just more learn about molecules and things like that, and that, that I kind of, I don't know about that. And, um, so it wasn't until I got there and was exposed to the different specialties that I could see, aha, you know, this, that, that's all interesting, and, and it's, it's kind of like... Um, picking what fraternity you want to be in just like oh that's clicks these these guys i i, I mean these are like my brothers they're they're so their interests and their personalities just line up with mine and and, and it's kind of like that for going into neurosurgery they had a terrific neurosurgery program at, at uva and the, the residents were awesome and so I, I just want to be like them so you're exposed to all kinds of specialties yes Orthopedics, the whole deal. Yeah. Radiation oncology, ophthalmology, otolaryngology, right? Are you everything? A, you're a professor of otolaryngology too. I, I have an adjunct appointment with my colleagues okay. in there. So you're exposed. But I should to say, you know, for the people who are listening, are not yeah. in the medical field, maybe their kids are there. There's a place for it. Everybody. I mean, their range. 
pathologists so important. Right. They're not seeing a lot of patients. You know. Right. I'm seeing a lot of patients. Okay. You know, it's it's it. it whatever your personality is, if you want to help people, if you want to do interesting work, well, there's a there's a place for you in medicine. So what type of discipline? I mean, everything about life, uh, if to be successful, you got to be disciplined. So to be in medicine or even med school, the amount of studying and the, the amount of work, you got to be extremely disciplined, don't you? You do. I mean, how do you focus on it? I mean, is your where's your eye, your eyes on the ball in residency, fellowship? Is it you're going to be a surgeon? I mean, you know you got to do certain things to get there. I'm just trying to get in the mindset of, of somebody that, that's younger that wants to get into medicine. And, and specialize. Yeah, I think I think the um, you know some people are just naturally always intensely focused and working like crazy. Me, not so much. You know, I I can be intense and really focused for a period of time, but I like to goof off. You know, sometimes and and that was the fun thing about being in college is every afternoon you'd have practice. You know, you right. do stuff. It's, it's more of a mix. You know, but for certain things, you just have to realize, well, whether you like it or not, if, if you want that, you got to work really hard. You know? So to get into medical school, you got to execute. you got to have a good plan and, and really work very hard uh, on your studies. And then once you're in medical school, depending on what specialty you want, like, Gary, guess what the most difficult, spe- like it's almost impossible to get into. Take a guess what specialty is the most competitive. <coughs> Uh, I, I don't know why I say it. I'd say ophthalmology. Close. Dermatology. Really? It is brutal. <laughs> I wouldn't it, have guessed it, that. Yeah, it's brutal because it's a, <clears throat> it's a small specialty. There aren't many slots. Huh. And it's important. Their hours are better. You know, this, so it is, there's, there's a lot of reasons. So they, you know, you, you people might, well, you know, why is this dermatologist so smart? You know, it's because you. It's so hard to get into dermatology. I had no idea. Glad no. you brought that up. So you're in med school. Is that three years? Four. Four years graduate med school. Then you headed to Seattle, right? Yes. And it was at a seven-year residency? Uh, that residency was eight. Eight years. Eight years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so tell us about Seattle. I mean, I know you probably can't get into cases, but did, you probably were in an emergency room. You probably saw everything, didn't you? It was <laughs> so fun, you know, because that's – you're studying a little bit, right? But it you're learning a trade, and and you're it takes that long to get pretty good at, at what you're doing. And um, every major academic medical center has a little different profile. And out there, it was there was one hospital called Harborview Hospital that's in movies and TV shows okay. and so forth. It's one of the busiest trauma centers in the United States, and tons of patients with gunshot wounds and things like that and so it was it was really intense is that where they do Gray's anatomy i think is they, that the i hospital? think they maybe they do i haven't watched it but but i saw some kind <laughs> i know harborview is is right. used as a set for some of these places so for somebody like yourself looking at yourself today as a department head or the chair that was a great place to learn, Seattle. Oh, it's terrific. And the hospital and you saw all kinds of cases. Yeah. So it prepared you but for even the more important were the people. It was a top-notch program, so the other trainees were really good. The faculty were phenomenal. It was the A team. Really, they, they were real. They and they still are really, really good. And that's a is that a hospital affiliated with the University of Washington or, or not? yes? So they had five hospitals, so you'd rotate through five different hospitals: like Children's, Veterans Hospital, and University Hospital, Harborview. And you had your kids here, but out there you were just you and. Well, David. we actually had two uh, two of our two of our children were, were uh, born. In Seattle. Okay. So we came to Iowa City with, with two little, little people. So uh, you get you after your residency, then what'd you do, after Seattle? Uh, I started the job here. You went you came know, to Iowa. Came right right to Iowa, right. Uh, and then and then you're an assistant professor, and you, you start building your cr- clinical practice, but when you're in academics, you also, are building your research program. And who were your mentors, Dr. Van Gilder? And who else? Uh, so Dr. Right. Van Gilder was the chair, chair. Uh, of the division. It was the division of neurosurgery at the time. So he was my direct boss, great boss yeah. in, in so many ways. And um, the person I worked most closely with, though, particularly in the beginning, we still work to this day, was Bruce Gantz. Oh, yeah. 
because uh, my, my research interest was in hearing related research and one of the big draws and attractions to looking at Iowa was in many ways they have some of the best auditory research people in the world here. He, he created something in a cochlear implant, didn't he, where you can hear if you lost your hearing, Dr. Gantz? He is uh, one of the world's leading research clinicians and researchers in the area of cochlear implants, and he was the first person in the world to place a cochlear implant in a child. Right, I do remember that. Yeah, I remember the, the old uh, otolaryngology, Dr. Maves. I don't know, do you know Mike Maves? I don't. Know. He was from Ohio State. He worked with Dr. Gantz way back when. I think he did a fellowship here. He ended up being the president of the AMA for quite a long time oh, wow. in the United States. He's a friend. He used to, uh, we used to run around together. Uh, and then I knew Dr. Pange, or Dr. Pange, you know who he is in Chicago? Mm -hmm. Pange, he did some things and uh, created, they called the Pange button and whatever in the throat and some other things. Dr. Bardock, you remember young oh, sure. Bardock? Yeah. He was a friend, so I knew a lot of those guys in that area. Great department. Yeah, yeah they had a lot. Dr. So when you're, was a when you're looking at... Uh, when you're trying to recruit people, you um, the reputation of the institution is super important. Beyond just the specific job you're looking at, you want to look around and say, hey, you know, is this the A-team? Right. Is, is this a place where you can be a star? And when you see ophthalmology, orthopedics, ENT, just, just doing so well, you go, you know what, this, this really is a great right. place. Talk a little bit about uh, your department, maybe your staff. And uh, what all do you do in neurosurgery? What all, you know, spine, there's stenosis, there's the brain, just what type of trauma, just maybe a little bit about your department. Sure. So from a um, clinical standpoint, the, the broad brush description is that we'll take care of any neurological disorder that may be treatable with surgery. So disorders of the brain, brain trauma, brain tumors, disorders of the spinal cord or the spine itself, and also the peripheral nervous system. So that covers a lot of things. A lot of things. And nowadays right. it's, it's uh, highly specialized, subspecialized. So you have to, if you're going to uh, be a person who's an expert in blood vessel problems in the brain, you have to have special training that they didn't have when I was training. So what, tell us how many people are uh, on your staff, how many surgeons? And we have 12 faculty members and... We have uh, 14 residents, so our residency program is seven years long. We take two pay, uh, two residents each year, so 14 total. Is there there's there's no longer period than neurosurgery? Is there seven years? No, yeah. but if you look at if you look at um, uh, specialties like um, congenital heart surgery, uh, some of these very complex high risk specialties, they'll have similar durations of training, but it'll be broken up a little bit different. They'll have a residency and then a fellowship, but it's pretty long. So what's and, your, and actually, some of our residents will go on and do fellowships after their seven years. So do you have quite a, uh, I mean, trying to choose your residents, is that quite a process? Oh, I mean, do you have a lot of applicants, I'm sure? It's hugely important. Hugely right. important. Yeah. So we have, so, so neurosurgery is a very competitive specialty, and they have this match. And our program is similar to other major U.S. programs where we'll have two slots, and there'll be over 230, 240 people apply for those for those two slots. But they're wow. applying to a lot of other places, too. So it's the, each applicant is applying to multiple locations. But the pool is very talented and very big. What's the process like for you? Are you, are you the ultimate decision maker of the residents? Well, um, Do you have a committee? We So we're a small department. So things that would normally be committee-based, we, we don't do quite so much. And... Um, one of the things that helped me learn to, to be a better leader, actually, was when I first took over as chair in 2001. One of the most important things is picking the residents. So I got, I really went on a recruiting rampage, one of the best applicants in the country to come and visit, all this. And then I picked the list. I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Their paperwork looked great. But I, I picked some people who, who weren't suited. A lot who did well, but there are a number that, that – so that was uh, not good. And as I step back, I go, you know what? I, I got I to gotta get the other people involved. I mean, 
they can pick things up. Right. I can't. Why? I don't have any special talent for this. Right. Why, why do I think I would? You know, let me let's make this a team effort and and get it. And those the residents who are already here are so motivated not to make a mistake on who we pick to join our team, because if someone falls short, mm -hmm. the load becomes heavier on the people who are still with us. Never so that. so they, yeah. they are checking, 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 and uh, and it, it improved dramatically once I um, – and the paper looked, always looked great for them, but the people who could handle the stress and the, the very difficult uh, training environment that goes with any neurosurgery, we, we got better at when I involved other people. So uh, that's an interesting leadership quality right there. Uh, so do your residents help you? The a ton. Resi yeah, oh, a ton. wow, that's neat. Because I never thought about that. If somebody's not cutting it, then it affects all the other people. Oh, it's bad. Yeah, if you had <laughs> – because it, it's – you know, they're not sitting in a classroom. I mean, right. They are taking care of patients. They're learning, but they're delivering care. And, for example, the call schedule, pretty tough. Yeah. If you got one less person in the call schedule – it gets tougher. What's what's your first? Uh, it used to be. I don't know what residency's like anymore, but it used to be when I knew some of these guys that they worked residents almost to death, like hundred hours a week, or they slept at the hospital. And work. Is it is it less demanding in the first few years, or is it still on call all the time and they never have a day off? Or what's it like to be a resident? Well, they used to have no restrictions on the hours. So when I was yeah. a resident. For example, as a chief resident, eighth-year resident, um, I covered Harborview. I mean, this was for all the chief residents. You, you'd have one chief resident at Harborview, one of the busiest trauma centers in the world. <laughs> and you would be there, be chief resident, every minute of every day except for um, one weekend. You would be off the hook at noon on a Saturday and then you have to come back Sunday night to take it back over. So it was, it was really demand. And that was, that was, that was a little over the top. You know, that was yeah. too much. And so now they have it's national legislation that they you you can't work more than eighty hours. Wow, what was the reason they did that? So you're you 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 learned how to work all night or be able to think on your feet or what? Why did they do that? So demanding. Um, Continuity, care, and responsibility so that if um, when you do what we call handoffs, like I've got a patient I'm taking right. care of who has all these problems. I talk to somebody about, you know, I got to go. You're going to take care of this patient. You can't possibly convey all the stuff that you've right. got in your head about that patient. So there's that. And then the other thing is that um, – on the responsibility piece, if you operate on somebody and it doesn't work out and there's a problem, you have to fix it. So you were, you're always want right. the best care for the patient, but when you're really, really tired and you're operating on somebody, every detail matters. And if you don't, if you don't, oh, you know, maybe I didn't quite get that bleeding stopped the way I should. And later there's some patient has to go back to the OR. You have to do it. It's not your body who, who gets stuck with it. So it's it's that, and and the other thing is you never know when you're going to be physiologically stressed. Um, some of these cases are supposed to be not too long, end up being super long. And through years and years of practice and training, you get your brain to work in a way that even if you're totally exhausted, I mean, you may not be able to remember people's names and all that, right. but this operation and this clinical care, you can do really, really well because... You're so intensely trained to, to do it properly. So what, uh, obviously, while you're gone a lot, deal you had to you know, take care of the home front and, the, and your girls. Uh, what's that like for if you're talking to a young resident on their spouse? How, how, how do you handle, how do you juggle all that with the amount, the demands on you and then your family and your children? That's a hard balancing act, isn't it? It's a make or break issue. Yeah, I mean, it, to me, the spouses are amazing. Yeah, you can't. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, it's impossible to really be successful in one of these super intense lines of professional work without a. If you want to have a family, you know, right? It, to, uh, without a spouse who's just as tough yeah. and, and uh, is is 
you know, going to take charge of things. And right. Doesn't need your help with this stuff. It's, right. It's in, you know, it's not going to go on forever. Right. But, um, yeah, his t- and I, th- I think that, um, oh, for sure, I, I, I would, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without uh, Delia, and, and our backgrounds are kind of similar in that, in that her, her uh, dad, was a Navy guy. Really? And and uh, her mom, one tough nut, you know, and my mom, tough nut. So it was, you know, when you're, and, and then the other thing is, you know, a really bad thing is to start feeling sorry for yourself. That, that's just bad. You, you ought not to go there. And I found it kind of easy because, like, I was I was describing that as chief resident. It's yeah. pr- pretty taxing. I had a picture of my dad on the battlefield of Vietnam. Mm. And so I go, this isn't so bad. Yeah. You know, I'm taking care of a lot of people who are shot, right. but no one's shooting me. Right. Like my dad had to get through. So, you know, right. it's not so bad. You right. know, I, I'm, I'm helping people. And the other thing is, the other guys were doing it the year before and the year before yeah. and the year before. Am I going to be some person who, who's going to, you know, feel sorry for yeah. No. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the military background. My father was in uh, World War II and four years in the Philippines, New Guinea, in the Japanese theater. And, uh, he had a certain strictness, uh, taught me a lot, taught me how to work. We didn't really sit around and complain a lot. <laughs> Wouldn't really tolerate that. He didn't make excuses. And uh, it was a good background to have. It was tough, but uh, uh, it taught me a lot, too. So those are good backgrounds. Pacific campaign. Yeah. It was rough. Yeah. He really did. And another rough. thing is you can always tell the guys in combat they don't talk about it, and he really didn't talk about it much. Yeah, my dad wouldn't talk about it much until the, towards the end, uh, and um, I was kind of we, we were at my daughter's graduation at UVA in this really beautiful setting, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And I don't know. I said, Dad, that that tr- thing, that object, way way out there, how how easy would it be to hit it with one of your cannon shots? And and I thought it'd say like, you know got to adjust it four or five times. He goes, no, I, we could probably hit it the first time, you know, and then he gets to talking about right, it. And he, right. would, and he would never, but when he was younger, he, he didn't want to talk about it at all. Right. Yeah. Tell us about, a lot of people don't realize the University of Iowa is a research hospital. It's a teaching hospital. You know, I came from Oskaloosa, and in any, any case that was somewhat serious, I should say that, you know, the docs referred on up here to Iowa physicians. So tell us a little bit about, in your department, uh, what things you're working on, what type of research, how are you trying to better the department, uh, just what's going on? Sure. And, so at the um, academic medical centers, we've got, we've got a, a mission that's different than a, than a regular right. hospital, and the resources are there to do it, and it's just designed that way, and the University of Iowa has been doing it for a really long time. Um, you need to have a lot of things in place to take on the most difficult and challenging cases. You need experts in other departments. You need all that under one roof. So you need a big, big group of specialists. And um, our job is to make not only take care of really difficult cases, but make things better. So um, that comes about through research. So for example, I was mentioning the blood vessel um, treatments. The best blood vessel treatment now in most situations is catheter-based, where they put a catheter in and put it up into their brain, vascular abnormality, and fix it. They didn't have that when I, when I was training. That came about through research. Um, patients with Parkinson's disease now, they have uh, it, properly selected patients can benefit from deep brain stimulators. We didn't have that when I was a resident. came about through research, and research is very difficult. You it's, it's enjoyable, it's challenging for, if you've got that kind of personality and mindset. Um, but, but it's really difficult. And, and it's all, yeah, actually, it's kind of an interesting story is, is uh, the COVID pandemic, serious problem. Yeah. And, and one of the most important breakthroughs that allowed us to get through it much better than would have been the case before was this invention of the RNA based vaccine. I'm not a vaccine expert. I'm not. Right. But this scientist um, who was originally from Eastern Europe, she was based at the neurosurgery department at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's the one, it was not recognized at the time, came up with this amazing way of 
making these vaccines far safer and far effective. And you can't do that unless you have lots and lots of researchers working on this. You don't see anything special, really, coming out of Russia. Right. You know, it's not, it's, it's the United States has this, this societal commitment and the resources to say, we will have world-class research. We don't know which ones are going to work out, but we're going to fund it. Good people are working hard. We're going to, we're going to support that infrastructure. So in, a, in an average week or day, you've got the clinic, you've got surgery, uh, and research. How do, you, how do you set that up? or how, What's your thought process on, on a, a week or a month? Is it different stages, or is it something every day you're doing in each part? So different people do it differently. My approach that I've set up and had in place for a long time now is very systematic. We have, like this morning, we had a research meeting. Most mornings, 7 o'clock, we'll have a research meeting. And that's different because surgeons, we have, we have to have our meetings where you're not going to be disturbed early. Once the OR is open, <laughs> it, 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 you know, you, whatever you're doing, you have to drop to take care of patients. Or, right. or like today, I got three or four calls from referring doctors. I want to take those calls. I want to help that referring doctor. So, so you get you get the research done early, and then it's all hands on deck. Let's take care of patients. So, uh, any other types of research going on? I mean, I was going to talk a little bit about Neuralink. I don't know if you want to get into that. Uh, Elon Musk, who obviously is amazing, Tesla, SpaceX, which even I heard that SpaceX is profitable, which I can't figure out because they're just sending rockets up and it'd be. I think it'd be a lot of money up front in SpaceX, but tell us a little bit about now. It's it, it's a, called Neuralink. What do you know about it? And since it involves the brain, tell us about that and, and how it affects quadriplegics. Well, as it turns out, um, our main research focus in our department is on what we call human brain neurophysiology. So we have the most grants in that area compared to other topical areas, and. Um, we're among a pretty small group of neurosurgical centers that does the cutting edge brain physiology research. And by that, I mean, you, you're having electrodes in the brain in these, in our research, unlike this, that other, the, the commercial company you're talking about, right. it, these are patients with epilepsy who need the electrodes in there anyway. And we're studying mechanisms of brain function because the electrodes happen to be there and patients volunteer to participate in these protocols. Um, there's a lot to it. It is really complicated. You have uh, advanced technologies that, that you're applying to try to capture these little neural signals and then figure out how these different brain regions communicate with each other. And one of the clinical applications is called a brain-machine interface where you take the neural signal and then that signal is processed in some way and then it, it drives an actuator. Uh, so people who would walk take some steps after um, a spinal cord injury because a signal was captured off the brain and then sent to a device that's in the spinal cord or stimulating the, the peripheral nerves. It is extremely uh, challenging work. And I, I think one thing that that company is going to encounter, as have like every other company that, that tries to do this, is doing the basic research, particularly in experimental animals, that's one thing. Once you start getting into people, you're dealing with a massive bureaucratic hurdle called the FDA. And working with the FDA is tough. And in many projects, that just kills it. It's just too expensive, too difficult. Now, there's a reason the FDA exists, because you, don't, you right. want things that, are, that you could use clinically to be safe and effective. Um, but they haven't, they haven't found the magic solution for that. It, it, it's just... just um, painfully difficult and and usually um like for example i, I got involved in um uh, when i was a medical student and invented this with some friends invented this idea to use magnetic force to guide an implant through the body and that ended up being a publicly traded company blah blah, blah. The, the investors had to spend i think it was 60 million dollars before we got into the first person now, Elon Musk got money, you know. So yeah. his, but <laughs> but but this 
So the science is there are great scientists. Most of the really good scientists in topical areas related brain computer interface, they have no clue about commercialization. So it's going to be interesting to see how this how this all comes together. But it would be great if there was a better way to get these ideas and this basic research through the FDA a little more efficiently so that people can benefit from it. How does AI affect what you, what you deal with? Is that something that you guys are looking into? Or Yeah. Because I know that's a buzzword right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I find it um, – uh, scary. I'm not. I'm not. I'm no AI person. But when because we, we do brain physiology, we have like I'm more of an electrode person, the mechanical design. Per, but we have signal processing experts who they use things like AI. You know, for my way of thinking about it, it's a black box. You know, they'll, for instance, we'll we'll record brain signals from uh, a patient as they're listening to different sounds. You'll give those signals to this black box. It'll try to figure out what the pattern is. Then you'll have the patient listen to different sounds, give the black box that the signal, say, what did, what did the patient hear? And now it's getting that they can, they can kind of figure it out. And wow. so it's quite, quite extraordinary, but, you know, levels above my understanding. Wow. But it's coming down the pike. There's a lot of talk No question about, about it. it. In a lot of different companies. What uh, – uh, <clears throat> do you study, like, Alzheimer's and uh, – Parkinson's, is that through the brain or is that research to help that? Yes. Situation? Is that plaque? I mean, I don't know anything about him other than it probably comes from the brain. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, starts I, I think the they're both um, degenerative diseases. And in in both instances, they're, they're good examples of how you, you need to understand the complexity at multiple levels. So at the cellular level, in Parkinson's disease, for example, these dopaminergic neurons are dying. They're, they're, they're gone. At a systems level, what that means is one connection is gone, the system's overreacting, and that's why you're getting these odd movements. But some clever people at Emory and a group in France years ago figured out, well, if the system's disturbed in this different way, we could put a deep brain stimulator in and change the network dynamics in a way where maybe they'll get better. And in certain ways, they do get better. So it was that, that's the most dramatic example of a successful, what we call neuromodulation application. And for Alzheimer's disease, the, the big emphasis is at the cellular level and, and trying to come up with drugs that, that block whatever this process is. And, and I'm not an, an expert in that, but there's a neuromodulation piece to the Alzheimer's disease puzzle, too, because there's, there's actually a company um, that was um, co-founded by my, by my cousin, of all, all people, that uh, they're putting in deep brain stimulators for Alzheimer's disease, and to, to st kind of using that same strategy as with Parkinson's disease, but a different different network. Do you get into genetics at all with what you do in neurosurgery, or does that even enter into it? N not so much, n except... Um, we have every week we have what's called a neuropathology uh, conference. So all the brain tumor patients we take care of, and we take care of a lot of them. Nowadays, they do incredibly complicated genetic uh, analysis, and it's, it's like going to school every week for me. It's things we never could have done when, when I was a medical student. You're just like, holy mackerel. They, they said, this tumor is being characterized by this genetic change, yeah. and... And it turns out that if you got this change and not that change, your prognosis is different. You respond to a different drug differently. So it's amazing. They, they, they've made it. I'm just an outsider looking in, but it, it's incredible what they've accomplished. So is there anything new in cancer research you want to talk about? I mean, obviously you work on tumors a lot, radiation oncology. I'm sure you work together. What, what's new in cancer research that you're seeing at Iowa? The most common primary brain tumor, meaning the tumor that started in the brain is called a glioblastoma, and it's a, it's a terrible uh, brain tumor. The uh, median survival statistics that we tend to use is about 14 months, so it's, it's, it's really bad. And whereas there have been dramatic advances in, advances in treatment for certain blood cancers, things like that, not so much for 
for uh, glioblastomas. And we, the, the group that's doing, um, I, I believe, is doing the most advanced work in this area at the universities in the radiation oncology department. So of all things, they, they found that um, very high doses of vitamin C seem to interfere with the mechanisms that the tumors have hijacked to divide too much. So it, it seems to be effective. But there, there is a lot of research going on uh, to try to make things better with uh, glioblastoma. And I'm confident that maybe not in my, well, you know, for our trainees, people who are residents now, they, I, think, I think they're going to really make it, somehow figure this thing out. It was a comparable thing was when I was a, um, a medical student, they, were, they had this disease where people's immune system was shut down and they were dying from infectious diseases that were very strange. And then they figured out it was this virus, it was the AIDS virus. And they tried this, they tried that, nothing was happening, nothing was happening. Now, they can control it. You know, they can manage it. So, again, it's that, it's that massive investment in good researchers. You know, just work at it, work at it tirelessly, year after year, learn from each other, study each other's papers, and, and you know, get after it. So you have a staff of 12. Do you have other researchers in your area? We do. Uh-huh. We, we've got a um, – so our brain physiology group – between our researchers that are in our department primary, primarily and our collaborators, probably have about 50 uh, investigators. So we have uh, funded collaborative programs, for example, with Johns Hopkins uh, University, uh, with um, UCLA, uh, University of California, San Francisco, a n- number of other places. So we're, um, you know, we're all locked in. It, and that's a pretty big group. From a state and federal perspective, uh, how's the money flowing in? Are you getting enough for research, or you always need more? Or what? You can always use more. Um, historically, there have been some downturns in the past where it's really bad because then people leave the field, mm-hmm. You know, particularly for the Ph.D. scientists, which is most of the work's done by the Ph.D. scientists. We're physician scientists. We'll still have a job if the research funds dry up, but your Ph.D. scientists – they're researchers. They're 100, and they and they need to be uh, funded. Right now, we're we're doing okay. Good. Could, good. could always use it more, but we're doing okay. Because I know people always want to give to cancer research, and hopefully that money comes back to the hospitals. Well, research. it's not. You know, nothing's going to happen unless that. Uh, I mean, yeah. That's the fuel. Right. That's the fuel that that makes these things happen. How did COVID affect your department, your patients? Uh, you know, you're trying to see somebody. They, you know, they don't want to get COVID. They got to wear a mask. Was that a? How difficult was that for you for your group during COVID time? The last couple it, of years, it was a stressor. Um, yeah, I and mean, actually, but it was mu- it was actually much harder on the patients and the families because you can't. You, you, the patients who are coming to our clinic, they have some pretty serious problems, yeah. and if you don't have a family member there, that's tough. Yeah, you know, that. That was the, the biggest problem. For us, it was masks and, you know, hopefully you're not going to get sick. But, but um, yeah, we, we you know, kept out. And, and our stuff is, a lot of it's urgent, emergency. You know, whether, whether it's a pandemic or not, you got, you got to get the job done. Right. You got a lot of trauma. But it's tough, very tough on families and their patients. Right. And when you're in the hospital, you couldn't have visitors. That, that was tough. Yeah. yeah that, that was a tough time. Hopefully you don't have to experience that again. So. Well, what else would you t- want to talk about, Matt? That uh, what uh, what are you most proud of? You, you know, think, yeah. I, I think uh, professionally, um, I, I was very lucky that there was a job available at the University of Iowa, and uh, my old boss, Dr. Van Gilder, was incredible. The institution's incredible. Bruce Gantz was incredibly supportive. And it allowed me to pursue my dreams and accomplish a lot of things I wanted to accomplish. Um, so I'm proud of that. Um, but the thing that that really makes me most happy is that um, when I have a team member who, who who came in, raw talent, doesn't know much, anything, you know, out of medical schools, gets into our training program acquires skills, gets better and better, acquires research skills. And then after all this time, he went from coming to Iowa with nothing, and then he, like, 
my, our vice chairman, Dr. Greenlee. Um, he won a, a presidential NIH award, a very prestigious thing. He mm -hmm. just had a paper in, in the journal uh, Nature, which is the most impactful scientific journal in the world. And um, he's a fabulous surgeon. You know, I look at that, I go, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> when I got his, <clears throat> when his scores, right. you know, when I'm first starting, you're really worried about your own stuff. You know, right. But once you, it's like, when I see him or the other faculty members hit a home run, it's like, great. This is, that makes me so happy and I'm so proud of that. It's kind of like a coach and you've watched your assistants grow up and now they're head coaches. That's it. You know, it's kind of like That's Hayden exactly. Fry, you know, he had, I can't even name all their assistants, Snyder and Brazier and Alvarez and Ferentz and all these guys went out and are hugely successful. It probably brought him great joy. Yeah. Yeah. Hayden. Yeah. Because yeah. he helped get that started. That's kind of a neat idea. What keeps you up at night? Um, oh, responsibilities. You know, w worrying about stuff. Um, the first time that kind of hit me was, it's kind of a weird story, is, is um, it was the auto department um, had a ice skating thing, you know, at the mall. Families oh. invited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so all these little people skating around, you know, people helping tie the little skates on. So. Yeah. And I'm sitting there, and for some weird reason, it just hit me. I go, oh, man. Bruce has got a lot of responsibilities. He's running this company with a lot of employees. Every employee's got a family. Right. What if you screw up? What if you have to let people go? What if what if the job what if what if they're locked into a job that's not good that you could have prevented from being not good? That's what I worry about is my team. I, I want I want my team to perform really well. And I, I, I don't want anyone to be adversely affected because, like, I didn't cross a T, dot an I, or, or, or go the extra distance to make sure that all the stuff that I'm supposed to do, I got done. It is amazing. What thing. do you worry about? Well, it's similar to what you said. You know, you the company, the, the, all the folks that work for us, uh, our leaders, uh, you know, bring in solutions, not just their problems. They try to bring solutions. We've got a great team, too. But, yeah, I do worry about it. It's a... It's a lot of people, it's a lot of families, a lot of lives are affected. And it is something I think about every day. So it's very similar to what, what you just said. So, uh, Well, I think that uh, people don't realize how, uh, you know, we're Iowans and we've, you know, I've been here my whole life. <laughs> and I don't know whether people appreciate the University of Iowa and what you folks do, but I certainly do. And I knew as a young young boy here, anything that uh, was there a car wreck or there's something serious, it was always come to Iowa. And uh, you know, Becky and I were in a hard hit on car wreck when we were younger, and they immediately shipped us up here. And and the and the folks were fabulous. The care was amazing. Uh, all the specialties I think we take for granted. Uh, you know, when I looked on on your website today and all the comments you get from patients, it's just amazing that we have folks like you. We're so proud of what your department does and all the departments at Iowa and all the department heads. It's, a, it's certainly a, a, it's a gem for Iowa to have such a tertiary care place like the University of Iowa, the specialties, the research that goes on. It's just, uh, as an Iowan, we can't be proud enough of what you folks do over there. Well, and, thanks, Gary. The, you know, these um, rankings, this and that. Yeah. So you say, well, what, what about clinical care? Where do we stand with clinical care? For me, what I say is, where do the faculty have their their family members cared for? Yeah, Iowa. I fly. Yeah. I fly family members right here. Right. This is and and I kind of know what's right. going on. You know, right. nationally. I want them here because right. this this is where you're going to get great care, and it's it's just a fantastic place. I remember a long but thank time. Thank you for those compliments. Well, well, it's our pleasure. I mean, I just can't say enough. Uh, when Doc Mays and I would talk back in the old days, uh, he he always said that there was a he always enjoyed seeing patients at Iowa because usually, not all folks, but most of the folks or patients he had respected what he said. They didn't argue with him. They uh, wanted to listen, and they were just so excited to be here and be able to get that kind of care. And I think that that's a good good thing for people from Iowa, that they do appreciate what, what, what the docs do here, and they don't take it for granted. 
And they do, li- and, and I think they're probably pretty good patients. They do what they need to do. They listen to you guys, and they try to get the best care they can. And, and uh, I think that's important. I know Mike would always talk about how he appreciated the patients compared to other places he'd been to. So It's different. It's different here. It, you know. In fact, we, we, they, <laughs> we do track all these metrics. And, like, for me, my, my, my thing, I don't score so well on being on time in clinic because I'm running behind. <laughs> And all this, but then we have we have a metric for the patient, you know what? Yeah. And I just learned about this recently. It's, you know, if they weren't going to show up, did they call? And, yeah. and, it, and there's national benchmarks. Our patients are objectively the best. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they they, they take. You know, they're trying to help out in their care, and yeah. they respect their fellow patients. They respect that everyone's trying to help each other out. Right. It is. It's a one from the physician side. It's a wonderful place to it's practice. A great place. Well, listen, it's been great to see you, talk to you. A pleasure. I feel honored to have you on. And I just hope people appreciate all of what you folks do at Iowa. And thanks again, man. Gary, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it.